Alright guys, welcome to part 3 of the video series. This part is going to be about making some changes to the pistons. I've machined the pistons down to reduce the compression ratio and I've also opened up the piston ring end gaps. Um, so both these changes are going to enable me to run more boosts safely. And I'll talk more about why I machined the pistons down to reduce the compression ratio. This is something that's not going to be beneficial for everyone. In fact, it's probably just going to be beneficial for me, uh, for what I plan to do with the engine. So I'm going to talk more about that later in the video. Now, talking about the parts, I know you guys are probably wondering why the parts still haven't arrived and why I haven't started putting this engine back together. Well, the thing is, I already cancelled the order from the guy I ordered the parts from previously. Um, I had a bit of trouble with the guy I gave him. He was working on another car that I gave to him and um, yeah, that car. I don't want to meant, I don't want to talk too much about it uh, in this video. Maybe if you guys want to hear about it, I can make a separate video about it. Um, but I've given him another other chance with the car, so let's see what he does. But getting back to the topic, now I've ordered all the parts from the dealership. The only reason that I didn't order all the parts from the dealership last time was that I didn't want to get the order on the bearings wrong, so I gave all the bearings to this guy and I wanted him to order the bearings so just to make sure that everything is right. But this time I did go through the hassle of figuring the colors and everything myself. It's actually not that difficult to order the bearings yourself. You just have to make sure that uh, you order the right numbers and yeah this time I just went to the dealers I just uh, made sure that the order is right and hopefully the parts should be arriving in a few weeks and I'll know for sure whether the clearances and everything will match up then and hopefully I can continue with putting this engine back together but for now let's just get into uh, machining the pistons so just to show you what I've done to the pistons here's what the piston looks like from the car before making any changes to it um, so it has this bit of a dome in the center and well putting it side by side you'll probably see the difference here um, so I've machined this part down by 0.75 of a millimeter it's a really small difference so I'm not sure if you're gonna be able to see it in camera maybe from this angle um, and then I've machined the center part down so I've removed this dome completely so you, there's a dome over here in the center um, that actually increases the compression ratio I've actually machined it completely flat um, so that's why the compression ratio is going to be lower now. Just to tell you the reason for why I wanted to reduce the compression ratio on my engine, it's because previously when I tested the car on 15 PSI boost, the engine did get extremely knock limited. I was actually detecting knock at around 14 degrees or 13 degrees of ignition advance. That's where the car was detecting knock. <laughs> So I was actually running 2 or 3 degrees away from that limit because obviously you don't want to run your engine right at the knock limit. Uh, the good thing is that these engines do have really good knock detection systems so whenever they detect knock they uh, retard the ignition timing immediately. But now obviously with the lower compression and with a few other changes that I'm going to be making to the car, hopefully reducing the restriction in the exhaust and all that, I think I'll be able to get away with a few more PSI of boost. Now for machining the actual pistons, I'm just using my milling machine over here. It's a, milli, it's a mini milling machine, but it works pretty well for this job. And I have an end mill over here. This is half inch, I believe. And the way I've bolted the piston to the milling machine, well, this piston would have been a difficult shape just to put in a vise because it doesn't have any flat ends on the side. But luckily, I had these ball joints that fit right into the wrist pin. And they're a pretty good fit, actually. So just putting these two ball joints on either side and then bolting them to the milling machine was actually a really easy way to fix this to the milling machine. And the good thing is that these pistons do actually have a machined surface at the bottom, so when you actually put this in the milling machine, the piston actually does sit pretty flat. I've already checked how flat it is. Uh, the way I checked that was I just lowered the milling machine and I just lowered it till the point where it starts touching. After the piston was flat on the milling machine, I just lowered the milling machine by 0.75 of a millimeter and just took 0.75 of a millimeter off the entire top surface. Now the surface on the center was a little difficult to machine so I had to center the piston using this point in the center just to make sure that the piston was centered to the milling machine. And after the measurements were done then I just lowered the milling machine by uh, 0.2 of a millimeter below the surface of the piston. And yeah, then I just machined the center part. After the machining was done, I just chamfered the edges to get rid of all the sharp edges that the machining leaves. 
So we're making sure that I removed equal material from each of these pistons just to make sure that I had an even compression ratio on all these pistons. What I did was I weighed the pistons as I went along like removing the material like first from the top and then from the center. So here's how the weights look like. So these were the weights of the pistons before I did anything to them. And I also weighed the wrist pins. The wrist pins, well in this case it's not going to be that important but sometimes the reason why you want to measure your wrist pins is um, in some cars you will find that some of the wrist pins will be heavier than the other ones and for balancing your pistons then you can match the heaviest wrist pin with the lightest piston and that actually helps you um, we balance out your pistons easier rather than removing material from your pistons to balance them uh, but in this case the wrist pins were actually extremely well balanced they were all at 124.4 some of them at 124.3 but still that's just a difference of 0.1 grams now the pistons did have a bigger difference so the heaviest piston was at 438.3 the lightest piston was at 435.7, so that's around a difference of 3 grams. Not the biggest difference, but still there is some difference in the pistons. Um, so after machining the top surface, here's what the weights were, and this is the difference in weight. This is how much weight I took off out of the piston. So after machining the top surface, I only took out 4.2 uh, grams from each piston. Uh, actually, these are the only two ones that are at 4.1, but still that's extremely close. 0.1 is like not a, diff not a big difference at all. Um, after machining the center, the differences were a bit larger, I guess because uh, this was a forged surface, whereas this was the top surface was already a machined surface before. So obviously machining a forged surface, you're going to get like a little more inaccuracy uh, when you machine that. Uh, that's why the numbers over here are a little different. And it could be also because of my machining, maybe I went uh, a little deeper on some of these than others. Uh, that's why the numbers, they are slightly different. And I think the difference between the largest and the smallest value is like 0.5 grams. That's still a really small difference. So, so yeah, in total I removed um, 10.5 grams for each piston. And just to put that into perspective, uh, according to the calculation, like my calculation of by, calcula by using the density of the aluminum, um, to achieve an 8.5 to 1 compression ratio, I should have actually taken out 12.15 uh, grams from the pistons. So assuming that the car had a 9 point a 9 to 1 compression ratio from the factory to lower it to an 8.5 to 1, I should have uh, removed this much material from the combustion chamber, but actually I only ended up removing this much. Um, that's partly because I was more careful when I was machining because I didn't want to take too much material off. Originally I should have removed 0.8 of a millimeter from the top of the pistons and 0.4 of a millimeter, like I should have gone 0.4 of a millimeter below the surface when I was machining this top part, but when I was actually machining it I stayed on the safe side and only went 0.75 of a millimeter on the top and I only went 0.2 of a millimeter over here uh, so that's where the weight difference comes from that's why the pistons didn't actually turn out to be um, as light or as um, the, the compression is not going to be as low as expected it's realistically going to be around like 8.55 or something rather than 8.5 but still that's a really small difference um, I think it's going to be really interesting putting these pistons back in the car because I already know the numbers that the car had before like the ignition advance and everything that the car had on the older setup and now it's going to be really interesting putting this back in the car going on the same boost level and seeing if I can gain any um, level of ignition advance and without running into knock or any of those issues um, and also how much more boost I can run on the same ignition advance level so that's going to be really interesting to find out. And one last thing to add, after getting the final weight of all these pistons, I did remove some weight from the heavier pistons, the pistons that were heavier than all the other ones, I did remove some material from them, uh, just to make all the weights more even, just to balance out all the pistons. Talking about some of the downsides of machining the pistons and uh, making this change, and also talking about some of the other methods you can use to lower your compression ratio, and why I chose this one. Um, well, first of all, just starting by the drawbacks of this, first of all, the first thing I should be doing is ceramic coating these pistons. I'm not sure if I'm actually going to do that because I don't have any shop in mind that does ceramic coating and I don't want to take the risk doing it myself. Um, that's why I, I, don't, I don't think I'll ceramic coat them. Ceramic coating is possibly something that will um, help a lot with these pistons because it provides a thermal barrier between the combustion chamber and the piston so less heat, heat transfers to the piston. Um, but again, I'm not sure if I'm going to be doing that right now. The other thing is that taking material off the piston will obviously also weaken the piston. Um, so I'm not sure, like, taking this little material off the piston, if it would weaken it by any significant amount. Um, I've heard other people shaving their pistons, like, um, they say it's safe to shave the pistons up to one millimeter, like take a full millimeter off the surface of the piston, 
and it will still be fine. So yeah, I don't think um, taking this little material off the piston would have any significant difference in terms of strength, or at least it wouldn't make a big enough difference in strength to cause any significant failure because these are pretty strong pistons. These are forged pistons from the factory. Another difference it would make is in terms of quench. Quench is, well, there's a small area over here that where your piston gets really close to the head and it forces some air to go into the combustion chamber that helps make the combustion process a bit more spontaneous which is basically there for efficiency but it also contributes to just a tiny bit of power now quench was something that's more significant in older engines that only had two valves in the center and they had a massive like quench area over here but these newer engines with like four valves or in this case it's a three valve engine they don't have that much area on the head um, for quench anyways, so I don't think that's going to be a significant difference at all, especially considering how little material I took off. And also talking about some of the other options for lowering compression ratio, well there's not really that many options. You can either um, go with a thicker head gasket, you can go with aftermarket pistons, which is, the, which is probably the most common option for most cars, but the problem is with this car, all the aftermarket pistons I checked do come in the same compression ratio, like they all come in, come with the factory compression ratio, which is 9 to 1. Um, there's no company that really offers lower compression ratio pistons for this engine. And the other thing is connecting rods. You could go with shorter connecting rods, but the problem with that is, yeah, first of all, you'll have a difficult time finding connecting rods. And the second problem is that you might run into clearance issues because this is already a stroked engine. Like, so the piston, when it like, reaches bottom dead center, it's actually extremely close to the crankshaft and also really close to the oil squirters and everything so you might run into clearance issues if you go with shorter connecting rods I'm not sure of that but it's something that m can happen but yeah talking about it lowering compression ratio is not something that you'll really need to do on this engine it's already a factory boosted engine it already has a 9 to 1 compression ratio so um, for running boost levels up to like 15 psi or even higher if you have a good exhaust system um, I believe people have run 20 psi on like these engines with the stock internals so they can take a lot of boost but it all depends on your setup like what exhaust you're using if you're injecting water methanol if you're using E85 or uh, race cast I know with race cast or E85 you can go way higher on the boost levels uh, without lowering the compression ratio because those fuels are more resistant to knock anyways but the thing is that I don't want to go with E85 or race cast just because I have a car that burns like 60 to 80 liters of fuel every track day so when you have a car that's burning that much fuel and moving it to E85 it becomes a massive hassle like carrying all that fuel around and like actually going and buying all that fuel before the track day and then carrying like about 100 liters of fuel around you every track day um, so that's why I just want to avoid that I want to stick to pump gas pump gas is easy you can find it anywhere you run out of fuel on the track you can just go to the um, gas station anywhere and get the fuel so that's really the biggest benefit. I will be installing water methanol on the engine later on. So that's hopefully going to give me another 3 or 4 PSI boost. But yeah, just talking about what type of boost levels I'm looking for. Like I was already running the car at 15 PSI. Now with this setup, I plan on going 20 PSI, possibly even slightly higher, depending on how the numbers look like. So that's extremely high. So this is not for someone who is planning to put a smaller supercharger pulley or something like that, because the stock supercharger will never go on boost levels that high anyways. So now that the pistons are all done, next I have to get to adjusting the piston ring end gaps. And just to tell you what a piston ring end gap is, just uh, so this is what uh, the ring. This is how the ring goes on a piston. It goes in these grooves that are uh, made in the piston. There's three rings. One ring goes on the top, then one ring goes at uh, this middle part, and then there's an oil ring that goes over here. Um, the way these piston rings work is, it's like a spring. It tries to open up, and it, it tries to apply even pressure against the cylinder walls when they're actually installed in the engine so that it can stop any blow by trying to like any exhaust trying to um, blow by your pistons into your crank casing and it also helps your engine make its proper compression because without these rings your engine will pretty much have no compression at all um, when you try to start your engine um, what piston ring end gaps are is there's a gap over here and when you actually install these rings in the engine you can see that there's a small amount of gap still left on the side and that's really important because if these rings are closed completely if they have no gap at all what will happen is that when your engine heats up and when these rings expand due to thermal expansion what will happen is that this ring gap will close uh, completely and the ring will actually try to expand even more and that expansion will actually turn into um, the ring applying more pressure against these walls and when that happens what usually happens is that it not only scratches up all your walls inside your engine it can also in extreme cases break your pistons because what happens is that 
um, these rings like they expand and they get stuck against the wall and when they get stuck against your cylinder walls it applies a tremendous amount of pressure on the piston and it usually just cracks the piston from right from here and you see these piston ring end lens just breaking off and talking about how much gap you should leave on the end of the piston how much uh, piston ring end gap you should leave to measure it you just need a set of feeler gauges that's pretty easy i'm going to show you that really soon on the engine but uh, talking about the numbers i think the factory the stock number on this engine is 0.5 i'm not completely sure on that but that's what i think it is uh, and th and that's a typical that's a pretty typical number for boosted cars because usually for naturally aspirated cars you would see a number around 0.4 and for turbocharged or supercharged cars you would see 0.5 the reason why they increase it in turbocharged or supercharged engines is because whenever you're adding boost to the engine there's additional blow-by and that additional blow-by obviously causes uh, these rings to heat up more and when these rings heat up more obviously they expand more and they need somewhere to go I'm going to be gapping these piston rings to 0.7 actually, I'm going to be increasing the gap. The reason is because I'm going to be using this engine for racing, I know it's going to be driven hard and I don't care about any additional blow by that will result in uh, by increasing this piston ring end gap. Getting to how to actually measure the piston ring end gaps, just insert the piston in your cylinder and then press, press it down with the piston so that it's nice and flat in your cylinder. Now there's one thing I did wrong in the video, the service manual actually tells you to insert the piston ring at a part that is not worn in your cylinder, so fairly high up where the piston rings usually don't touch the surface of the cylinder walls. Um, I actually pushed it fairly far down, which I later corrected. Um, so yeah, just make sure that when you insert the piston rings in your cylinder, they're fairly high up in the cylinder. Um, that will give you a more accurate reading. If you push it too far down, you'll actually get a larger value than uh, you actually should be getting. Uh, so yeah, just be careful of that. For actually measuring the gap, just use your feeler gauges and the largest feeler gauge you can fit into the gap, that is your piston ring end gap. For increasing the gap on the piston rings, I just use the Dremel attached to a table and you can even use a table saw or like, you can even file these down by hand if you want, but that will just take longer. Uh, but just make sure that whatever method you use, the ends of the piston ring are nice and square. And then at the end, I just chamfered the edges too, so that the sharp edges that the cutting bit leaves, you shouldn't be um, putting that you shouldn't be leaving those on the piston ring because they can scratch up your cylinders when you put them in for putting these piston rings on the pistons just make sure you follow the right orientation because you shouldn't be putting these rings upside down there is a side that says top and that should be facing the top of the piston um, so yeah just make sure you follow that it's also important to clock these rings properly so where these end gaps should be facing but that's something i'll talk about later when it's time to actually put these pistons in the engine now I know some of you guys have already been asking uh, what parts you need to do an engine rebuild and um, uh, what, are, what is the cost of actually rebuilding one of these engines. Well I'm still working on the list, I, there's still some more things I have to order that I haven't figured out like um, the exhaust manifold studs and things like that that I really haven't figured out because I don't know which what type of exhaust manifold I'm going to be going for right now. Uh, but once I do get all the lists sorted I'll definitely put a list together and all the prices and everything and all the part numbers that you need to do to do one of these rebuilds. It's definitely not a cheap rebuild I've already spent I think $3,900 on it just adding all the bills together but yeah it also depends on how much you do want to replace on your, on your engine some parts are obviously definitely necessary to replace like the head gaskets and the head bolts and things like that but there are other parts that are completely optional like um, for example the timing chain which might not have stretched but I've ordered one anyways and yeah hopefully by time for the next video the parts should be here and I should be able to start putting this engine back together so definitely stay tuned for that one I'm really excited about that um, so yeah hopefully see you guys in the next part